Welcome back to Public Speaking. This is Emily Seal. Um, up to this point we've kind of cleanly gone over a chapter and worked our way chronologically by page number through the book, but today it's going to be a little more um, a little more flipping through your book. I apologize in advance. You'll be skipping between chapter 6, chapter 7, um, uh, and that's just because today we're really going to focus on an outline from beginning to end. So starting with um, your opener, your specific purpose, your thesis, and then kind of how to set up an outline uh, working all the way to the end. So bear with me. I'm sorry if it's a little un, uh, feels a little chaotic. Trust me, there is a method to my madness. So if you haven't already, please um, either print off or have quick reference the tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. because we'll be, I'll be referring back to that over and over again as sort of the example of how to um, work your way through an outline. We're going to kind of use that as a guidepost. So if you haven't already, I would recommend I have it printed out sitting next to me as I'm giving this lecture. So the opening, um, for an opener, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but I'm sure most of you are kind of familiar with a tease of some kind, to draw your audience in. Um, so for your first speech, your humorous anecdote, you were able to say, hello, my name is, and that's fine, you know, or once upon a time, just jump into your story. But now we really want to grab the audience's attention with the first thing out of our mouth. So um, you can see here that I just gave as the opener, I just said, I didn't list out word for word what I was going to say, I just said I'm, I'm going to use this quote, right? Um, you might say rhetorical question, you might say um, definition of something as the foundation of the rest of your argument, but um, just listing that opener and how you plan to open, because remember you don't um, want to just jump into your speech, you need to give a sort of beginning summative overview before you dive in. So um, always have a title and a heading on your paperwork as well. And then we um, move down to the specific purpose uh, and we'll talk about that. It's It means to either persuade or reform or entertain, but the purpose of your tribute speech is going to be to persuade your audience of and then fill in the blank um, you know, in this case, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s importance. So, and then your thesis ought to preview your main points. So you can see um, in my speech what it would look like is I would open with, if I have ever seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that quote is by Oz Isaac Newton. And to me, that means um, that I study these great public speakers and these great thinkers and I learned from them I learned from their successes I learned from their failures and um, I borrow courage from them and every time I get to go over the I have a dream speech in class uh, I, I get to borrow a little bit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s courage who's a very courageous man to say the things that he said at, at such a time when it was so unpopular to say those things. It takes a certain um, courage and tenacity that made him the um, great man that we still celebrate today. So I picked two ways to divide my speech. I chose to look at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a prophet and a poet. So everything that's under Roman numeral one, that's pointing out um, who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was as a poet. And then everything under Roman numeral two is pointing out who he was as a prophet. And I won't, um, go over that in detail. I hope that you'll sit down and read the content of that. Um, and you can see in Roman numeral 1.2, uh, he references the four score and seven years ago by saying five score years ago. And um, he is referring to that huge statue behind him of Lincoln sitting in the chair. So I just kind of wanted to visualize that for you. 
and um, what he was kind of dealing with was the march for jobs and freedom. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't just talking idealistically about some, you know, far out dream that ideally world peace, everybody's just holding hands. Although there's an element of that to it, it was also very practical in here and now. Like, I want jobs for these people of color <laughs> in this audience right now. Um, it wasn't just an abstraction. It was these these people are having to live in tenement housing. It's There's all of these injustices. And um, thankfully, uh, just a year after that speech, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is still sort of coming into its own in America. And then, of course, the persecution. Uh, but I'm sure we all know he died for what he believed. So those are some of the highlights of the things in this um, outline. Because we have so much content to go over, I, I I won't belabor the point, I just wanted to sort of illustrate it for you if you've already read it. Alright, so um, the opener, like I said, hopefully that's kind of self-explanatory. That's the first thing out of your mouth. Now for the specific purpose, it always begins with to inform, to persuade, or to entertain. Some of you are worried about plagiarizing me. Don't, don't worry about that. And um, the specific purpose, as it says on page 76, always begins with that language to inform to persuade or to entertain and it's not necessarily that you are going to state your specific purpose out loud um, but that is going to set the tone I think actually um, yeah there it is. it's going to set the tone um, for the rest of your speech so if, if your tone is persuasive you're going to use persuasive language you're going to paint a picture you're going to draw us in if you're just speaking to entertain you can keep it light but if you're trying to um, inform us about something that is you know heavy and dense then you're going to have a different tone and and I have such problems with my students in this you know they they give the first humorous anecdote and it feels good to get a laugh but the second assignment is a tribute um, and that doesn't mean it may not have some element of humor to it but the the goal in this is to persuade people to honor um, perhaps someone who's passed or someone um, who an organization something it's time to be a little more serious so always look at the tone of the speech you're giving um, it's a pretty common amateur mistake to think that uh, you can kind of just recycle your gimmicks and and hope that it works for the rest of the semester so not that not that just because you're getting a laugh that's gimmicky but I just say that to say this is a different assignment and um, that may require a different set of skills so if you look at it and you say why does it say that the topic of my speech is Martin Luther King Jr.? And it says my specific purpose has Martin Luther King Jr. And then my thesis has MLK. Don't worry about those redundancies. That is, that's just, you know, part of it. And like I said, um, this is your introduction. And as we'll say later, you're going to tell us what you're going to tell us. Tell us and then tell us what you told us. So don't be worried about saying the name of your person too much because most of you will not say the name of the person you're paying tribute to enough. Uh, we need to hear it over and over again in order for it to sink in. So that's my cheesy fortune teller. What happens sometimes is some of you have a sort of baggage around a thesis statement in public speaking I want you to um, preview your main points it's just one sentence that is a synopsis of your speech but it ought to preview your main points so for me I just said I'm gonna pay tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a poet and as a prophet I've picked two different sides of him you may pay tribute to someone's personal and professional life you may pay tribute to um, this person as your grandfather but also as a veteran so um, remember that this is only a two to four minute speech so you really want to keep your thesis statement relatively simple and easy to comprehend um, if you don't if you try to make it too elaborate or too much like a thesis statement you might think of in an English class it's not going to be um, understandable for your audience so don't overthink it your thesis is um, should have your topic in it and preview your Roman numerals or your main points 
<sighs> As I have already confessed to you, organization is not my strong suit. This isn't actually my room. I, I wouldn't share a picture of my room um, because it's not much better than this. Uh, I am an artsy fartsy person and not always good at putting things back where they belong. But um, today we want to talk about the importance of organizing our thoughts before we share them. Um, um, and as I just said, I kind of gave it away. Tell us what you're going to tell us. Tell us and then tell us what you told us. As you look through my outline, you'll see that I have transition statements. And you may feel like that's a little bit, once again, redundant. Why are you telling me what you're about to tell me? You're telling me you're going to have a historical and a biblical reference. And then the next transition, you're saying, I just said a historical reference. Now for the biblical reference. Uh, and, and you may look at that and say, this is a bit laborious. Like if I wrote this in my English piece, her, my English teacher would be like, what? This is um, redundant. But when we're speaking publicly, we're accounting for short attention spans. We're understanding that it's a different format. And when people are listening, we need to remind them where we are. We need to remind them of what we just said. Um, and we want to keep the train moving forward. And uh, as always, we want to keep it extempore. So if we see that people are nodding along and they get it, we can, you know, keep going. Or if we see maybe this person is not really that familiar with the Bible, maybe I need to give a little backstory. Who was Amos? Who was, um, who was Judah? Who was the uh, nation of Israel? So as you kind of watch, you can move through your points, but you want to make sure and have lots of little mini transitions that say, okay, that was the political reference. Now we're moving on to the biblical reference in order to keep that. Okay, now we've described Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a poet. Let's move on to who he was as a prophet. So we're always going to try to give those directions as we give our speech, those um, transitions to clearly say it. And you can't really say where you're going unless you know where you're going. And this is one of the most common speech problems, especially when we get to these later speeches. You try to do too much or you don't have a clear organization pattern and you lose us. So here are seven ways to just divide a speech. Um, we want to avoid this. We want to avoid, you know, if you've ever been to a buffet and you may see people piling food up on top of their plate and you don't know where the french fries end and the onion rings begin. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to just throw information at people. Um, we want to create a well put together meal right? We're going to start with a first course. We're going to move on to a second course. We're going to divide the speech for the audience and make it consumable to your audience. If you throw a lot of cluttered information, you're going to lose people. They're, it's going to fire hydrant them. They're, they're going to be overwhelmed. You want to create a consumable speech that is clearly marked the path. And um, I'm mixing my metaphors now. I'll move on. <laughs> so by far the most common way to divide a speech, and we're on page 97, is topical. And that just means into two different topics. This is what I did with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who he was as a prophet and who he was as a poet just two different ways to, to cut the pie. Chronological would obviously be by date. Now some of you may be wondering if you're going to pay tribute to someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Why wouldn't you just chronologically, exhaustively go through every single event in their life? Well, remember the tone. Going back to that specific purpose. If the purpose of my speech is to endear you to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., telling you every little event in their life may not do that. It's informative, but it's not persuasive. So I would challenge you that while some dates might be important, you can look on my tribute speech, you'll see that I have quite a few dates on here. Um, dates are not always persuasive, right? This isn't, um, this isn't a factual um, kind of speech that you know your informative speech might be this is more heartfelt right so um, but chronological is definitely a legitimate way to organize the speech spatial um, that division has to do with um, how it relates so 
when I have you guys pair and share and we kind of go through the classroom, I'll often work from um, the front of the classroom to the back of the classroom. That would be a spatial division. If you're going to pay tribute to the human body and you started with the brain and worked your way down to the toenails, that would be a spatial division. Um, if you're going to pay tribute to a country, you might start with New York City, come down to Nashville, and then finally pay tribute uh, to Miami, right, because you're working your way down the East Coast. That would be geographic or spatial relating to place. Causal, poor little polar bears. Um, this is often a persuasive tactic, which is to trace a cause to its effect or its effect to a cause. So if I was going to talk about global warming, I may show some polar bears stranded out um, on an ice cap because uh, I'm talking about that as a real world effect of global warming. So, you know, global warming may seem like a high and lofty idea, but then when I show you the real world effect of it, that um, makes it more tangible. So causal would be working from effect to cause or cause to effect. So um, I hope that makes sense. And we'll talk about this a little more when we get to persuasive. Pro and con, obviously this is not something you want to do for your tribute speech because it's not going to persuade people to like your person if you tell them about all of their shortcomings or faults, right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had affairs. Uh, I didn't include that in my tribute speech because that doesn't endear you to him. Uh, so pro and con is obviously for the informative speech. Maybe you're going to talk about uh, the pros and the cons of um, recycling. You may think that recycling is something that we ought to do, uh, but is it really making that much of an impact, right? So we come up with maybe two or three reasons why you ought to recycle and two and three reasons why recycling is difficult. Uh, so love me, love me not, love me, love me not. And that helps us to be unbiased, but obviously, like I said, it wouldn't be good for the tribute speech. <laughs> so gross, isn't it? <laughs> My husband loves uh, to watch these infomercials. He just thinks they're hilarious um, and uh, so bizarre. The infomercials almost always start with a convoluted problem. I mean, they're showing you, oh no, this really super, you know, cheap knife won't cut a carrot. And then dun, 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 you need this jitsu knife that can cut your finger off, uh, you know, so it gives you a clear problem and then offers a solution to that problem. Uh, and then you have the burden of proof of establishing that this problem can be overcome. Very common persuasive tactic. Along the same lines as a need plan, it's very common in sales. If you're going to go into sales, I would spend a little extra time on page 102 because it's probably um, the methodology that you'll be using. Um, so you establish a defense deficiency, present a proposal, then demonstrate logically how that proposal could then be implemented um, and demonstrate that. And so it's kind of the same thing as a problem solution, but it, it shows you more definitely in a four-step process how that need can be met through your product or through your um, proposition. get it because I did it before and I told you what I'm going to tell you no okay <laughs> so here's one thing that I always kind of come back to when I'm grading your outlines if it's too complicated if your wording if your sentences are like five lines long and you probably need to distill your information a little bit more probably need to sort of kind of come up with the bumper sticker version of saying what you're saying because once again in the oral presentation style we need to be um, not necessarily more simplistic but we need to make this consumable to your audience and if you haven't thought it all the way through and sometimes it can come across as overly complicated so um, this is just a really helpful um, little paradigm here that they have on page 103 and I said paradigm I don't think that's the right word but it's a little trick 
<laughs> that's a better statement it's a trick uh, and that is the four S's the four S strategy and this is wonderful if you're doing like an impromptu speech just to remember these four things uh, first we want a signpost now um, a signpost is usually a number or a word that gets your audience through it so just a minute ago I said here are the seven different um, ways to divide a speech, the seven patterns for dividing a speech. That would be considered a signpost because I say number one, number two, number three. So first we want to signpost. Um, then we want to state, right? So that's the second S is that we state. And then thirdly, we're going to unpack that, right? We've, we've presented the truth of what we're saying and then we're going to kind of unpack it with definitions or statistics or anecdotes and then we summarize what we just said. So um, if you look at uh, Roman numeral number one, we're looking at that iconic language. We're looking at um, the quote that was historical. We're looking at the quote that was biblical. And then I say, hopefully I've established that the poet um, uses historical and biblical references, but I would also like to address uh, that he, uh, was a prophet himself so that would be a summary statement so just kind of going through those four and once again it may feel a little didactic it may be a little overly clear this is just us starting to work towards being understandable and um, if it evolves into something a little more complex over time that's all right but uh, we want to make sure that our audience can stay with us because more often than not we lose them so this is very intentional, the four S's, but I think it's a great way to give a speech. And obviously, you know, we would wash, rinse, repeat this process. <laughs> we would, um, you know, if for a four minute speech, you might have two different main points, or I think I actually have four <laughs> different main points because I always like to use every second of my time. Uh, I'm a ham. So I would kind of do this process four times and then sometimes I needed to support it more. Sometimes I get into the sub sub points, the little eyes, the little Roman numeral. Um, and then other times uh, it's more simple and doesn't need that much unpacking. So there we have the bridge across in uh, Nashville. You can think of transitions as guiding your audience across that bridge. So there are some, I think, four different types of transitions that we'll go over on page 108. And that is, um, the first is causal. So it traces the cause to effect. Therefore, because, consequently, as a result, please don't use those if there's not actually a relationship um, between those two things. Uh, then we have contrasting. On the other hand, nevertheless, uh, contrary. Now, try not to use a contrasting transition until later in your argument right? I don't want to open my speech with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a poet. However, he was also a prophet because that is, he's, those are not two opposite things. Those are actually in the same vein of each other. So there's no use in using that contrasting. You don't want to contradict yourself too much because it, it doesn't bode well for your confidence. So you save those contrasting for later in your speech, especially if you're doing the pros and the cons of something, right? We want to introduce the the pros of it first and then move on to that contrasting language um, because if if we flip-flop back and forth between pro and con and pro and con and pro and con it's kind of like watching a tenants match you get a crick in your neck um, complementary this is by far uh, the most common right likewise not only in addition just as important and then chronologically, first, second, last, before, later, after a while. So if you use one of those seven different ways to divide your speech, you're going to want to use the transitions that go along with the organization pattern that you've set up, right? So, but I want to hear lots of these transition words. Okay, moving on kind of our skim of chapter eight and moving on to page 141 outlining outlining so you can think of this as a blueprint for your speech right it's not that you have to say every word word for word that's on your speech in fact 
you ought not do that. I remember we're speaking extempore. You have your game plan, you have your ground plan, and if you deviate from that plan, that's okay because um, it is a plan from which to de deviate. We should have tentative outline at the top of every page because we understand um, that we're speaking extempore. We're trying to reach our audience. So the first thing that an outline does that's good, that is right, is it tests the scope. Um, and you can think of that as a zoom in or a zoom out. Have you ever tried to take a picture of a person but you were too far away and you can't, you know, you, you may have taken that picture and then later you say, I can't even tell who that is. I can't even see their face. Some of you will try to give really vague speeches if you were to pay tribute to your mother and you say, you know, she is very kind and compassionate and caring. She takes care of me like a mother ought to. My mom is great, <laughs> right? The scope of your argument is so large that you're not actually saying anything. There's not a lot of specifics. I probably couldn't pick your mother out of a crowd based on your speech. So think about, are you trying to cover too much material? Are you being too vague? Are you not even, um, telling us anything actual uh, but then also you can zoom up too close right so test the scope of what you're saying we want to have enough information that it is um, consumable that we as listeners can understand it um, but we also don't want to have so little information that we don't have a lot to go on so find the scope of your argument it tests the logical relations of the, of the part. You want to compare your apples to your oranges, right? We want to compare, um, we want to put things together that kind of go in the same um, vein, right? So we're going to compare Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, historical references to his biblical references. Those two things kind of fit together in the same pod, as it were. So that would be my A and my B, right? kind of things that go together. <laughs> this is me trying to be cute. <laughs> um, it's a Frozen musical, uh, Disney. Uh, a reindeer will beat you and curse you and cheat you. Uh, so you want to test that um, the things your A, B, and C actually do support you're one. So Sven's argument is that reindeer are better than people and he has three different ways that people suck. Right? And so all of that logic flows up. That is to say those those pieces of evidence all support all that A, B, and C all support your one. Some of you will be tempted to throw in random facts right that's just kind of how your brain works that's not a good idea in public speaking we always want to have a logical flow of information we always want our logic to flow up for our a's and b's to support our ones and our ones um, to support the thesis if the logic doesn't flow up you need to cut the information or recategorize reorganize it checks the balance of your speech so you're going to only speak for two to four minutes I would only want to speak for a minute about how Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a prophet and only speak for a minute about how he's a poet if I spoke for three minutes about how he's a prophet and then I only left one minute for how he was a poet right then that that isn't balanced that isn't um, I'm leaning too heavily on one point or another and if I find myself doing that maybe I want to once again go back to scope and kind of zoom in maybe I just want to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. the poet so check your balance of your speech and the one of the biggest problems that I see with this in people is spending way too long on the introduction you'll see on my outline introduction isn't even Roman numeral number one the introduction is that stuff at the beginning the opener the specific purpose and the thesis because it's only 30 seconds it's not a whole minute right so especially with these short speeches don't try to open with a big huge anecdote or a big long explanation of something uh, you need to get to the point and get us through the points fairly quickly and then summarize the points and then lastly it can be the, the notes that you have as you um, speak but once again we just want to write on that one or two note cards 
maybe your Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're not going to write our speech out word for word. Maybe we're just writing a quote um, and we're using the phrases like the, uh, the short form outline on our note cards. We're not going to take the paper up to the front of the classroom because that will tempt you to read rather than to focus on eye contact and we want to focus on eye contact. <laughs> right. As I said earlier, some of you, um, when you're hearing a speech, you'll be feeling like you're trying to take a sip of water out of a water fire hydrant uh, be because people are overloading you with information. I had a girl give a speech about recycling and she told us a hundred reasons, a hundred ways that we could go green and she just lambasted us with all 100 of her tips. I mean, she's just coming and coming and coming at us. And I would bet that very few people walked away from that speech with much information because there was so much information. You need to edit. You need to um, boil it down for us. You need to give it to us bite by bite. You don't need to force feed us. Um, so uh, only represent your, you know, your A your Roman numeral, your sub-sub point should only say one thing in that sentence. Don't try to say 15 things in that one sentence. This isn't an English paper, it's a speech. So um, just every A, B, and C ought to represent one idea. One of these things is not like the other one. <laughs> so you want to have some consistency right? Uh, you want to have your Roman numerals, your A's and your B's, your 1's and your 2's. Uh, please don't try to be cute and put smiley faces and hearts and wing ding font. <laughs> we want to keep this basic as it is. You can see there on page 144. Adequacy. Adequacy. So you will notice on my outline and then also in the cons consistency there that there isn't a one without a two and if you see that on your feedback form can't have a one without a two and that's because you want to have at least two pieces of supporting evidence to support any main idea you always want to have two legs to stand on even this kung fu master here if I um, pushed him over it would be easier when he's just standing on one leg right so you always want to have at least two legs to stand on um, maybe you don't really like politics and so when I give you um, you know a historical reference and how Dr. M Martin Luther King Jr. is referencing another historian uh, as historical political figure you're like eh, I don't really like politics but maybe you respect the Bible or maybe you're an atheist you don't respect the Bible but you can respect Abraham Lincoln. So I want to have a couple different ways to persuade you. I don't want to lean too heavily on any one idea. Uh, I want to have variety within my argument. <laughs> I love that toddler meme. I see it all the time and I just I always just want to chew on his little cheeks. Too cute. So um, please always use full sentence outline. We're not using a short form outline in this class so take the time to construct sentences with a beginning, middle, and end. The only place where this gets a little sticky is with the um, demonstration speech because often they will be commands, right? Like, um, first, uh, turn on the water, then soap up your hands, right? So uh, they may be shorter sentences, but we still want to have complete sentences. Uh, so lastly, a good outline is parallel, and this is a concept that hopefully your English teacher has touched on, but let me just belabor the point a little bit more. So you want to try to compare similar elements. So once again, I'm comparing the historical references, and those go right along with the biblical reference. Uh, you want to try to have a com comparable parts of speech in your comparisons. I, I'm calling Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a poet and a prophet. I'm not going to say he's a poet and he also prophesies because um, prophesies? He's prophetic? I don't know. I might not have said that right, but you get the point. I want to use the same part of speech. So you may be tempted to say, my father is a family man, but he also works construction. 
you would want to say my father is a family man and a construction worker because those that's a adjective and a noun and an adjective and a noun right especially in that thesis sentence so we'll work with this then the day in class when we kind of do an outline all together and hopefully this will help clarify you want to try to work in a uniform verb tense uh, this can be a little bit tricky when you're dealing with people who have passed and their work lives on because um, their speech or their work may be in the present tense, um, but you may be speaking of this person in the past tense. But for, for the most part, we want to try to be consistent. Uh, obviously, when I get to Roman numeral four and I say, I am you know, I still draw on the courage of MLK to continue. I'm, I'm speaking in the present tense, but most of my outline is in the past tense. Um, in general, you want to be in the present tense unless you're talking about someone who passed. Um, as I already said, make sure you've got those proper transitions as you're working through, but it's worth saying again. All right. Lastly, we're going to flip back to page 93. All right, so this is, if I have people kind of punk out and get lazy, this is a common place for people to punk out and get lazy. And it's so senseless to get lazy at the end of your outline here because there's so many electronic ways that you can get help. Now, some of you have never done a work cited before. Um, and you might need to set up an office appointment with me to come go over what is a work cited or talk to your English professor about it. For the purposes of this class, we will be doing an MLA work cited. Um, that's probably the same as your English class. You may be asking, like, what's the difference between APA and MLA and Turabian? Well, it just kind of comes from different schools. The School of Science, right, if you're going to get a Bachelor's of Science, traditionally, sciences kind of rely more heavily on APA. The American Psychological Association created that, the way that they um, have little titles, the beginning of every little paragraph, right, they're trying to um, work more from a science-based perspective, whereas MLA, and this is a gross generalization, tends to be more liberal arts, more... Um, of a uh, humanities perspective. So this speech, uh, we're trying to get you started with English together. So for our purposes, we'll go ahead and do MLA. Although if you go on to do speech on a doctoral level, you may end up doing APA or Turabian. But don't worry about that. Just remember MLA. That's the format that we're using. You may have a little brown handbook. If you don't already have a little brown handbook, uh, you may want to invest in one. They're available in the bookstore. They're available online, anywhere. You just want to make sure that the MLA 7th um, edition, we're on the 7th edition of the little um, brown handbook or the MLA in general. But all of this is available free online. So easybib.com is your best friend. So if you're going to, uh, for example, cite your textbook, I would just turn over to the back here. I would put in the ISBN for those of you who have never worked in uh, retail. That's just that big long number 9780133753837. If I put in that ISBN, it will actually give me a citation so easy. Now I just cut and paste that onto my work cited. Notice that in MLA format we um, this is uh, these citations are alphabetical right now some of you are like I'm paying tribute to my Nana <laughs> do I still need to have a work cited and that depends if you're going to talk about uh, if you're going to open with a quote remember you always have to create a citation for a quote and if you, you can't use good reads you need to tell me the actual source that it came out of or a legitimate um, publication or go check that against a quote book you always want to have your quotes cited but they're in alphabetical order here according to the first word in the citation so um, remember that there's a hanging indent which means that you can see Duarte there is at the big 
beginning and, and flush to the margin, but then every line after that has an indentation. So if, I, if even if my citation was like four lines long, every line after the first line would be indented. And that helps me to be able to quick reference the different sources that you included. Just another really good resource is Purdue. Um, and you'll hear me say Purdue University OWL because Online Writing Lab is, they kind of shorten it to OWL. And so that's a really useful resource. Say, you know, Nancy Duarte, her blog, uh, Communicating Like MLK and Changing the World, that's actually a YouTube video that I used. But I know that Nancy Duarte is a, you know, a legitimate. Uh, source and so you know that even though it is posted on YouTube it's also posted on her blog so don't say just because something is located on Pinterest or just as something you found it on Facebook or you found it in YouTube that doesn't mean that the original source of that information comes from that site so do a little digging find the original author the original publication the original um, place and if you're having trouble with that problem Process, you can see me or you can see your librarian. Librarians are very helpful in finding the original sources. <laughs> I always feel a need to be a little bit pedantic so bear with me but um, if you have your textbook in front of you right you can open to the very first you'll see Revel all this stuff about um, how to use it with an iPad that's not what we're doing. Turn the page again and we have um, the title page turnover again and we have the original publication date can you find it can you find the original publication date looks like this one is 2015 that's the one I am seeing ninth edition 2015 so Oh, copyright 2016, actually. I see that now. Copyright 2016. So you want to put the newest date, even though it was published in 2010, 2013, and then again in 2016. And you'll notice, okay, like as I'm recording this, it's not 2016 yet. That's not uncommon for things like this to be sort of. Um, but, right? So the public, the the title page make sure that you're looking at those things that you don't just if you're going to create a citation for this work you wouldn't just cite George Grice you want to be thorough cite all three authors right and and Grice would be first alphabetically right so really take the time to sort of put these things in um, and be uh, specific don't rush over the details. Don't assume just because you cite, let's say you've got an article from NPR, don't just say according to NPR, right? Because <laughs> the NPR is constantly playing and there's tons of different broadcasts and there's tons of different programs and there's tons of different reporters who work for NPR, so we want to be specific. Um, and as always, I said this in the chapter two on ethics, but it's worth repeating. Make sure that the sources you're using are credible, unbiased, that the information we can trust. There are probably some um, propaganda out there for pretty much any topic you can come up with. Uh, once again, The Onion is a funny newspaper. It's not real. <laughs> BuzzFeed may be entertaining. Uh, but it's not necessarily a credible academic source. So anytime you're questioning a website's credibility, send me a quick email, talk to your librarian, um, re-examine um, sort of the advice in your book, and we'll work through this together. But um, all of that to say, a work site is not necessarily required for the first speech, um, but it'll definitely be required for your informative and for your persuasive speeches because they are research-based. You have to have a minimum of four sources. Notice I don't have Wikipedia on here. I do have encyclopedia.com, which is a fantastic source. So I hope that that has helped you sort of how to make an outline uh, I know that for some of you, typing all of this up can maybe for computer reasons, maybe um, just because it's in, intimidating as an assignment. Um, but I'm here for you to answer your questions and to 
give you plenty of examples and right choices and we can work through this together. Please don't slack off on your outline. If you turn if you refuse to turn in an outline it's an automatic loss of one letter grade so um, please make sure you have it printed and ready to turn in as you walk up to the podium to speak. As always, thank you for listening.